Good morning, everyone, again, and welcome to The Art, where we will have two speakers today, Jane Babcock and Abigail Delgado. Um, I'm your host, Trevelis Hunter, retired United States Marine Corps Sergeant Major. Um, I want to introduce myself for a second to talk about why I'm here. I realize, and I've talked to the, the host, I've talked to the, um, the sponsor of this organization, Al Albert um, Renteria. And he's given me a lot of information. A lot of people that I've, that I've got a chance to meet give me a lot of information and things that I wish I would have known before I'm, well, now, you know, I'm transitioning, I'm retiring out of Marine Corps. And um, I just wish that these, these this, this is information I would have had well before this moment. Um, I'll say this to you persons that are you Marines or you military members that are looking to, at some point, your expiration date will happen. You'll transition out of the military, whether you retired or whether you get out on, on, whatever terms there are, you're going to transition out of military. Utilize resources, opportunities, talk to people, because there's a lot of information that, you know, TRS and the transition programs, it, it gives you the wave tops, but there's still more, so much information out there that you, that I would implore you to look into, uh, implore you to, to network. Uh, so that, and that, that's why I'm here. I'm here networking. I'm here introducing myself. As you see, I'm also here to network and connect with people with, to help me get towards the direction where I'm going and also help others do the same thing. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce your first speaker, Jane Babcock. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's nice to be able to be here to help you understand your VA benefits. In the past, we have talked about filing an intent, which is basically the VA form 210966, and it's just to notify the VA that I have a medical claim to make, or I have a financial claim to make, or I want to start my voc vocational rehabilitation and employment services, or it may even be that you're filing to relieve yourself of a VA debt. And for your surviving family, it's the beginning of when they can file for wartime veterans pension or DIC. So this becomes your land marker. You have to make sure that you pay attention to that date because it will affect your back pay. If you're filing an intent, you can actually just call the 800-827-1000 telephone number Monday through Friday, but... If you call in the middle of the day on a really busy day, you may have a hold time of over an hour. So you may want to work with a VSO. We'll talk about that in a minute. You can also go online if you have an established VA.gov or My Healthy Vet or eBenefits account, and you can file an intent and or the entire claim through there. But filing it by yourself is can be a big mistake when it comes to benefits. So again, VSOs are important. You can also go to a regional office, which there aren't that many of them, and they have VSOs, but they also have uh, people there that will help you file that intent and any other part of your claim. But I really honestly think your best bet is to go to a VSO. Stomp the floor. VSO. VA, you can also mail in your claim. It's going to go to a huge, humongous warehouse type environment where they're going to scan in the documents and they sign them digitally. And so that's where paper goes if you don't have the ability to scan and upload documents. The second cl class that we talked about was VA evidence, the types of evidence and the responsibilities. VA is responsible for a lot of different types of records. But remember, what you send them is the only thing you can guarantee is in your file. So if you walked out of service with your service treatment records, medical records or personnel records, anything of that nature, you're going to need to submit them to the VA. And since VA will not pay for civilian medical records, mentioning you went to a doctor in the civilian side of the house, VA is going to say, oh, we, we're not going to pay for those. Do you have them? So gather them ahead of time and send them in. It saves them and you a lot of heartburn. You, of course, also are the one that owns your own 
marriage records, birth records for dependents and things like that. So one of the types of evidence that you can provide in lieu of medical records, you twisted your ankle in basic training and again, say, well, you were stationed at Taji or someplace like that, and it's been giving you trouble ever since, you can get buddy statements, people that saw you get injured or saw the purple bruising of your ankle and things like that. They can write witness statements. Basically, to the best of my memory, these are the events that happened, spring of 2017 at Camp Taji. So, if, or, you know, my friend so-and-so was constantly begging Motrin off of me because his ankles were killing him. Things like that. Your family can also write those things because you have a one incident in service, but now it's been 20 years. Your family can write about the reoccurring problems you had with your records. Now, let's get into monitoring your claim. Because after all, you want to know what's progressing, what kind of notes are being made on your claim by either the rater or the examiner, because you will go in for a comp and pen exam. So you can call your VSO rep. They literally can log into the computer and see what's going on with your claim, what stage it's at. Oh, gee whiz, when we sent, when we faxed in those two copies of birth certificates, they got stuck together and the VA is only seeing one dependent. So let's go ahead and send in the one that they are, quote, missing. So they can save you time ahead of time. Or you can call the toll-free number. Again, 1-800-827-1000. But they can only give you what is the most recent information on your claim because they're just looking at the same database that your VSO would but they don't maybe have as much training and personal knowledge on questions that they need to answer for you. So your VSO, again, is your best bet. You can establish a VA.gov account if you don't already have one, or you can log in to an existing account, and you can look at those basic notes to stage what's going on inside your record. But again, the VSO may be able to better interpret it or catch something that says, oh, quick, go get me a copy of this record. So that'll save you a lot of time. You can check the status of your claim on the electronic format and any decision reviews or appeals processes. You can even look and see if your application for VA healthcare has been approved or turned down. Now, what to do if you agree, or excuse me, disagree with a VA decision? They come back and say, oh, we're rating your knee 10 or 0%, meaning, yes, you damaged it in service, but we don't see how it's impacting your current life. We don't see that you have any medical records showing subluxation or arthritis in the knee or any of that stuff because maybe they didn't get the medical records that they thought they should have. Or the examiner, you walked in and they went, how are you doing? And can you squat down and touch the floor? And you did. And they said, can you know, can you see it? put all your weight on one leg and things like this? And you did those things because that's what we do as military people. <laughs> We're told to do it. We do it. So the, the problem is, is when you go to an exam, the VA examiner should be saying, if you squat down to try and touch the floor, at what point does the pain start? At what point do you have weakness? If you weren't taking Motrin or something all of that nature every single day, would you be experiencing weakness in that joint, especially when going downstairs? That's what should happen in an exam, but doesn't always. So be very honest. And again, as I've said in the past, write your own personal statement have buddy statements and or family statements saying these are the events. You know, he stumbled down the stairs just a few weeks ago because his knee gave out. Um, 
he used to play baseball with his buddies, but he doesn't anymore because his ankle kept rolling when he would go around the bases and then he'd fall. Those kind of things tell them that there's lacticity and other problems with those joints. So those personal statements, no matter what they're about, are really important. So if you disagree, they used to have a process called notice of disagreement, where you could send in a, a statement saying, I disagree with your findings, here's new evidence, or here's a buddy statement that finally got to me, or here's a new medical record because I've been into the doctor since I filed, um, and keep your claim going. Because remember, from the day your intent arrives and your intent can also if you don't want to file an intent you want to just file the whole claim because you already put it together the day the VA receives either one of those starts a one-year calendar so maybe your claim only takes six or eight months and comes back and they say oh it's zero percent and you're going no 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 my knee is a lot worse than that in fact I'm getting ready to have arthroscopic surgery so now you send the new medical records in or no, I don't have any new evidence, but I think the Raider applied the wrong rule when they looked at the chart and said, based on the symptoms, this is what the rating would be. Hearing loss is common to get 0% at first. You have a mild shift in hearing, but you don't need hearing aids. You're not really struggling with understanding people and things like that. So you'll probably get a zero at first, but then when you get to the point where, okay, yeah, it's becoming real noticeable, then you're up at 10%. That's based on those actual hearing tests. So if you do or don't have new evidence, you can file a supplemental claim. This is the first step and the lowest level in the process. If your supplemental claim comes back, again, not approved or something, or there was no change to their answer, and you feel it needs to go further, then you can go up to the next two steps, a higher level review and or a uh, board of appeals. This Remember, a board of appeals and the board of veterans appeals are two different things. One is actually a court type situation. The other one is simply a review process and can be done with a judge rather than a panel of judges. So identifying new information or new records or anything that you need to submit, VA has a responsibility to help you gather new evidence. And to, when they send you a decision letter, it will say, this is why we denied you, or this is why we rated you this low. If you disagree, these are the types of things that you can do to uh, have us review your claim, the supplemental claim being the first one. This can be filed within one year of that VA decision letter. So if you don't get those medical records and stuff into them or file that form, the 20995, your claim is going to close which in most cases means that you have just given up that year and a half, two years of back pay. So be aware. Now, my recommendation to you again, use a VSO because you, they can fill out the form electronically, blast it off to the VA. If you need to get medical records from say a hospital two states over, they can request the release form, you sign it, they scan it right back to them. And with your permission, that hospital can actually direct those records right back to the VSO office, who then turns around, labels them, and scans them into the VA. So much quicker process than trying to mail them in and more likely to be accurate. The higher level review is the second step in the process. This is when you absolutely don't have any new evidence to provide, but you believe that there's an error in their decision and you Basically, you're going to write your statement, why you think their decision was incorrect. This, again, is a good point where a VSO is able to look at the regulations, look at your decision letter and say, oh, they had an ENT, ear, nose and throat doctor, examine your knee? That's not allowed. And this is the rule the VA just broke. So 
that knowledge helps you find those mistakes in your ratings process. You do have the opportunity to either have that senior rater or senior adjudicator review and, and agree with you, hopefully, that this is the rule they broke. Or you can ask for a one-time conference. It can be through a, a teleconference meeting type thing, like a Zoom with a higher level reviewer and specify your claims. But if the VSO agrees that this is a blatant error on their part, why bother waiting? And it could be months and months to get that teleconference going. So, and if it still comes back against the decision you think they should have made, you still have that ability to go to the Board of Appeals. This is a different form. It's a 0996 instead of a 0995. Again, VSO Knowledge will help you choose which is the right one. Board of Appeals. The Veterans Law Judge at the Board of Veterans Appeals will review your decision. This is a decision that could be done with a single judge. Um, you have different types. You have the direct review where I don't have any new evidence. I just want the judge to look it over and make sure they applied the laws right. I have new evidence or I actually want a hearing. You can go all the way out to Washington or wherever the regional office is that is processing your review, or you can do a tele-meeting. So this again, but if you disagree with your initial decision and you choose the Board of Appeals, you can't go back to the two lower level reviews. Same as if you're in the middle on the higher level review, you can't back up to the lower level. So that's why oftentimes VSOs will recommend, if it's a pretty clear shot type thing, that you go with the supplemental and or the higher level review simply because it still leaves you another option to continue fighting. This is a different form, 101.82. So please, again, Know your forms because you send in the wrong one. You may be cutting off your nose to spite your face. The final whole process is to go to the Court of Appeals. To be honest with you, as a 11 and a half year nationally accredited VSO, having filed over a thousand claims with VA, a well-developed claim going in all in a packet at one time, is a lot easier nowadays than it used to be. Back in 08, when the economy had gone upside down and all the foreclosures and everything were happening, it could take three years to get an initial claim done. Now, generally speaking, you're going to get it back in six to 12 months. So using a VSO, knowing the rules and laws is really good. Your VSO is trained and they attend annual training. They're employed by either your state, your county, your tribe, your parish, or a veteran service organization such as DAB, American Legion, and all those. And that means they have an agreement signed with the VA saying, I'm going to represent veterans and their spouses and their survivors, and I promise not to charge. If a VS, accredited VSO charges you for their services, they're wrong and you need to report them. I'm on LinkedIn and I'm easy to find. <laughs> I do articles. A lot of times I'll post things in people's posts, you know, get a hold of me. I'll happy to share the tools with you. I share the links and attachments to the various tools I use to teach VA with. I'm happy to provide guidance. I cannot file your claim because I'm no longer employed as, as a VSO. I am fully retired. So all I can do is tell you the rules and regulations and then how to get that accredited VSO to help you train the VA in its own job. <laughs> Recently, I had to help a family who's other than honorable Vietnam veteran improperly discharged from service under other than honorable. 
get his VA benefits because he was dying from a presumptive illness. So, and we just got notified the day after he passed that the branch of service had agreed to amend his discharge. But by then he was already in the VA healthcare system and being taken care of that way. That amendment just meant that he could receive the compensation benefits he had filed for and his widow was now going to be receiving DIC. So never think you're not eligible for something. Go to your local VSO representative, accredited VSO, and find out for sure what you're eligible for. If I can help in any way, I'm happy to do a video call with you. Prevless, did you have questions for me? Uh, yes, Dan, I do. I have a couple of questions, actually. I'll say good morning again. So I was taking notes and um, I'm gonna read from my notes. I had a couple. I had a couple of questions here. I'll say you already answered answered them, but I I just want to clarify some things. Um, as I heard you say six to twelve months is how long, how long it takes. Um, if you start your claim prior to your prior to exiting the service, and you know you hit, I think it's one hundred and one hundred to one hundred eighty to ninety days out. Um. How long does it take to get the claim process after your your, your EAS or the end of service? Okay. Well, that's going to depend on how quickly your base and or post can get you your comp and pen exams and stuff. Generally speaking, on the larger posts with VA support facilities nearby and things like that, they can get a claim done in 90 days, especially okay. if it's a situation where the veteran is leaving and has serious medical issues. Now, I caution you, getting that VDD process started early is very important, especially if you think there's any way you may qualify for a medical discharge. You need to notify your unit that that's one of the things you're seeking so that they can start their administrative side of the house. And that comp and pen exams are evidence toward that medical board process. Don't, unfortunately, a lot of reserve and National Guard especially will be deployed and injured and it's not that bad or they suck up and drive on. And then they get back to home station and six, eight months later, like myself, they I wasn't deployed, but I was on 45 day orders uh, when I was in a stupid on my part accident. And I ended up six months later back at my unit facing surgery to have my neck restructured with scaffolding and replacing a disc and things like this. And then found out that I had two torn tendons and a rotator cuff injury. Hmm. So I could have, since I had 21 plus good years and over eight years of active duty time, I could have filed for a medical requested to medical board, but I, didn't know. Yeah. So I didn't. And so I, quite often. I could have received my benefits for full pay and TRICARE right away. Mm -hmm. I'd gone through that process. And, but it was for me, it was four years later when I went through the VA process because nobody in my unit knew anything about VA. So when I was injured and told them I needed this surgery and everything, they just went, Oh, well, lucky for you, you got your 20 plus sign here. You're in the retired reserves. You know, it's crazy. No one knows. And I think no one knows. Um, no one understands until they look back and say, I, I could have and I wish I would have. And they, a lot of times they don't listen to the people that are saying I wish I would have so they can not wish they also would have as well. And so I'll just say to everyone, please listen, uh, listen to the, these. I wish I would have. I wish I could have and all these different things that can set you up for success on your way out. Well, hey, Jane, I do have another question, though. Um, okay. You also mentioned that there's VSOs and to utilize your VSOs, and you said not to utilize those those agencies that charge you. But I, I'll ask you this again. Um, at what point should I do that? Let's say I've gone to the VSO and I really believe that I rate more and I, I've done all these processes. I've gotten my claim uh, back and I'm like, this is not enough. This is not right. I I believe I rate more. Should I go ahead and hire a uh, organization that will get me that I believe will get me to that higher percentage rate that I believe I, I rate. 
It's not necessary. And the reason I say that is a lot of these folks out there that are doing contract here, we'll help you file your claim. We'll guarantee that you get a rating of a certain amount or mm -hmm. we'll uh, get you the medical evidence that you need by sending you to one of our doctors. Right. Okay. Most of us that are going to file a claim have a have a an affinity to being honest to the point of sometimes detriment to ourselves. So using a doctor that's maybe writing you up a certain way just because they're under contract, mm -hmm. that's not real honest. Also, mm -hmm. the agency itself that you're thinking about paying may not be accredited. They may not be going to annual training. They mm -hmm. may not have the resources. They may not be able to actually log into the VA's computer system and say, hold on a minute. You didn't apply this rule. Uh -huh. Go back and fix this before your claim even gets published. So don't shortchange yourself on the various ways that the VSO can help you. The other thing, of course, is that VSO is paid by your tax dollars and or the nonprofit's money. So they're not going to charge you. And, and employ them they, to do their job. Yeah. And a lot of times I'd get a decision. And of course, the guys are not knowing any better, not knowing the rules, not knowing what symptoms justify an increase. Hmm. They would accept the decision of the VA. Oh, I got 10%. Or I got 30%. Yeah, but you should be 40% or even maybe 50%. And that's and why you go to your 50%, VSO. Yeah, at 50%, everything in the VA, all care, all pharmacy, um, emergency room, co-pays, things like this, disappear at 50%. So, and they're also going to go, oh, you're at 30%. Guess what? Your children now through the state benefits will have free tuition or have this other benefit. So that VSO is active on the federal side and the state side. So they're going to be watching out because after all, they want their boss, the county exec, to give them a good rating too. <laughs> and so they're looking to do right. And they're looking to do it quickly. Whereas some of these claims agents will base it on a percentage of your back pay. So do they want it to take six months or would they rather see it take 12 months? I want six months. Yes. And go to your VSO. And if you meet a VSO that you really feel is just a chairborne ranger, only there for the paycheck and or the he's getting ready to retire and doesn't seem as forward with you as they need to be, then go to their boss. Okay. And then call the guy in the next county and say, hey, can I come see? I had people that drove from two counties over. I mean, it's worth it. They knew, it's they knew I was a bulldog. <laughs> yeah. Good. But Jane, thank you for your thank you for the information. I, I say this again, as we've spoken in the past. Thank you for your help. And I'll definitely continue to reach out as I have questions, even aside from here. If everyone notices, uh, you see her point of contact on the uh, LinkedIn um, communication uh, on, on the slide here. Please utilize her. If you've listened to the um, the answers, the questions, the information she's provided, um, reach out. Reach out and ask those questions. Ask the 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 most simplest question. You may think it's a small question. You may think it's like, you know, whatever. Everyone knows this, and this is a dumb question. Ask it anyway, just to get clarification. Make sure you know it. Make sure you're setting yourself up for, up for success. Okay? And um, if you have older veterans or their widows or their surviving dependents, please. Reach out to me or to your state, county, tribe, parish, VSO, and ask those questions. There's so many things that are being left on the table. Yeah. I'm, I'm learning that now. Yes. Bye, everyone. Oh. Take yeah, care. Bye, Jane. Thanks again, and I'll see you later. Bye-bye. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the next uh, speaker is Abigail Delgado. She's going to come up here and talk about, you know, contracts, uh, it, not just for veterans, but just for small business owners as well, but how to do business contracts with Caltrans. Uh, without further ado, Abigail. Thank you, Travis.
Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me here today. I'm excited to be here with you all just to share about our small business unit at Caltrans and the resources that are available to you all as small businesses. Again, my name is Abiel Delgado, and I'm the Strategic Engagement Manager for Caltrans District 8, which covers both Riverside and San Bernardino counties. So today I'll be going over any important notices, give an overview of our small business program, and then we'll get into how to do business with Caltrans, where I'll be covering over the types of certifications that we recognize as a state agency and how to navigate some of our online contracting portals. So this is just our non-discrimination policy statement. It states the California Department of Transportation under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 ensures no person in the United States shall on the ground of race, color, or national origin be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Caltrans will make every effort to ensure non-discrimination in all of its services, programs, and activities, whether they are federally funded or not, and that services and benefits are fairly distributed to all people, regardless of race, color, or national origin. In addition, Caltrans will facilitate meaningful participation in the transportation planning process in a non-discriminatory manner. Related federal statutes, remedies, and state law further those protections to include sex, disability, religion, sexual orientation, and age. For more information on how to file a complaint or regarding Title VI, you can contact our Title VI branch manager at the phone number and link at the bottom of the slide. Moving on into our small business program overview. So we currently have three team members to ensure that our small business program goals are met in District 8. Those people are myself. We also have Shanae Farrow, our District Small Business Liaison, or DSBL. She's typically your first point of contact if you have any questions regarding getting certified, any small business matters, or if you're interested in any procurement, contracting, or outreach opportunities. She is, however, currently on an extended leave until sometime next summer. So in the meantime, I'll be your main point of contact. And then if I'm ever not available, Suzanne Kalesa, our program manager, can also answer any of your questions and ensure that you get taken care of. We do also have a shared inbox. It's dhsmallbusiness at dot.ca.gov. So um, all of our team members have access to this inbox. And if you send us an email there, it just ensures that one of us sees it. So our role as a small business office is to educate our internal and external stakeholders on the value of certifying as a small business, disadvantaged business, and disabled veteran business enterprise. We are basically your advocates within our jurisdiction. We conduct and participate in outreach events just like this one, just to encourage small business participation. After these events, we do like to track and evaluate our performance just to ensure that we're providing quality services to the small business community, as well as identifying any areas of improvement for our program. We also cultivate partnerships within the community and other government agencies just to collaborate on ideas and industry efforts to bring the most opportunities to our small businesses and help meet our small business goals. And we also market Caltrans upcoming contracting and procurement opportunities online as well. So the small business office provides opportunities to meet with your staff for one-on-one -on -one consultation meetings to discuss certification and educate your staff about contract bidding and procurement opportunities and what those processes look like. We also host mandatory pre-bid meetings. So these are networking events that provide small businesses the opportunity to meet and form connections with our prime contractors. We have one mandatory pre-bid meeting scheduled on the 21st of this month. This project is for building work, HMA, our hot mixed asphalt and temporary portable sanitary facilities. And then on January 4th, we have another mandatory pre-bid for HMA, soil mail, structural concrete and roadway excavation. So these man meetings are mandatory for our prime contractors, meaning that primes have to be present for the entirety of the meeting to be eligible to bid on these projects. If either of these projects along the lines of the types of products or services you offer, I highly encourage attending so that you can network with our primes. 
And if you subscribe to our small business mailing list, you'll get notifications regarding those projects. And I'll have the QR code to sign up for our mailing list on an upcoming slide. We also have our minor program. These are minor A and B. These programs are for projects specifically geared towards small business firms with minor B projects being up to 388,000 and the minor A being up to 1.25 million. Our minor program is a great way for small firms to become prime contractors on a project. We also have a co-mentor program. So this is an architectural and engineering mentorship program where large firms or mentors are paired with small firms or protégés to encourage more small a &E firm participation. Our last Cal Mentor Fall event was in October in LA, but we are planning our next event this coming spring in San Bernardino County. So there'll be more info to come on that. Lastly, we have our Construction Mentor Protege Program. The mission of this program is to assist the development of emerging construction companies so that they can compete successfully in Caltrans projects and hopefully ones that will make a difference in their own community. Our kickoff event is tomorrow, December 14th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. at our Southern Regional Lab in Fontana. If you're interested in attending, please reach out for more information. I'll put up my contact information again. You can find more information on any current and upcoming projects on Contractors Corner and our Look Ahead report. Our upcoming outreach events may be found on our Caltrans Small Business Calendar, so you can take a moment to see these QR codes to your phone if you'd like to. Moving on to how to do business with Caltrans. So Caltrans recognizes four types of certifications. Those certifications are small business micro, small business with the purpose of public works, disabled veteran business enterprise, and disadvantaged business enterprise. We've gone over the SB and DVBE certifications in past workshops. I'll try to breeze through those. So these are just the eligibility requirements for small business micro and small business public works. So for both, you must be independently owned and operated, not dominant in your field of operation. Your principal office must be located in California and your owners must also live in California. The difference between the two for small business micro, you need to have 100 or fewer employees and average annual gross receipts of 16 million or less over the last three tax years. And then for public works, it's 200 or fewer employees and average annual gross receipts of 37 million or less over the last three tax years. And if you qualify for small business micro, you don't need to necessarily have a public work certification. Those are for um, construction type projects. meet the eligibility requirements to be certified as a disabled veteran business enterprise, you must have a service-oriented disability of at least 10%. U.S. military, naval, or air service must be at least 51% owned by one or more disabled veterans, must reside in California, and you must be managed or controlled by a disabled veteran. So our DBE certification is for federally funded projects. To meet the eligibility requirements to be certified as a disadvantaged business enterprise. You must be a U.S. citizen or resident alien, be a member of a socially and economically disadvantaged group, have a personal net worth of less than 1.32 million. Your average annual gross receipt for the firm's previous years may not exceed 30.4 million. And this was effective March 2023. So it did go up a little bit. Uh, you can almost be a for-profit small business where so economically disadvantaged DBE owners on only 51% trans and have managerial and operational control of the business operations. You must not be tied to another firm in such a way as to compromise with your independence and control. You must also hold certain licenses or credentials as required. So while we're not required to hold one of all small business certifications, to work with Caltrans, it is highly encouraged. These certifications can open additional opportunities for contracting with us and can help us increase our small business participation goals. So those goals are 25% for small business micro and public works, 
5% for disabled veteran business enterprise and 22.2% for disadvantaged business enterprise. And then in September of this year, Caltrans also announced an initial 5% small business participation goal on all non-emergency contracts that are state funded and have bid openings after October 1st, 2023. So why is being small business certified important? Being certified with one or all of these certifications that you're eligible for will bring you additional benefits when working with us. SB and DVBEs receive a 5% bid preference and are eligible for SB DVBE only option for procurement and contracting opportunities. Your firm is also listed in the SB and DVBE database on DGS's website, Cal eProcure. This database is available to other local agencies as well as our prime contractors, making it very easy for our purchasers and contractors to find your small business when looking for a firm to do business with. These certifications ensure that you receive invitations to Caltrans procurement fairs, pre-bids, and any other outreach events that we host as well. So it's important to know that you're not alone when you're seeking to do business with the state or with Caltrans, myself and other DSBLs and their small business offices statewide do provide that same one-on-one -on -one assistance directly to our small businesses. And we're here to discuss best strategies on working with our agency. We provide technical assistance on a variety of topics, including the preparation and submission of applications for the certifications we'll review during this presentation. We also assist in navigating our online contracting portals, such as Cal eProcure and Contractors Corner and can route any other questions where appropriate to subject matter experts within our department. We host and participate in a variety of public outreach opportunities to increase the visibility of our department to our small business community. Again, these events include our mandatory preview meetings, procurement fairs, contractors boot camps, and events such as this one today. And finally, we are a resource to our own staff within Caltrans who have purchasing and contracting needs and are trying to source small businesses to solicit bids from. In short, your district small business liaisons are your best resource when trying to work with our department. So getting certified is a relatively easy process. The SB and DBBE certifications are an online application submitted through the Department of General Services. That is their Cal eProcure site. This is also known as a statewide marketplace. After you submit your application and any required documents, you should feel back on the status within a few weeks and you will need to renew your SB certification every two years. DVBE must be renewed annually. The DBE certifications can also be completed and submitted online through Caltrans DBE system website. It can take up a month up to a month to hear or receive a response. There is no fee to apply except for the cost of having your application notarized. And DBA certification doesn't expire um, unless you become ineligible. So you must resubmit your documents every five years just to verify that eligibility. Again, Cali Procure is the website that small businesses and DBBEs can go to get certified and identify procurement opportunities. Circled in red below is where you'll go to get certified. Clicking that button will send you to this page. It includes the instructions and details so that the process was seamless. They also have video instructions that they provide. You just wanna make sure that you read the instructions carefully and have everything ready for when you apply. Once you are ready, click on the button that says get certified. And I've heard with DJS's workload, it may take up to a few weeks. So if you're looking to get certified, definitely try to do that as soon as possible so that you're ready for any opportunities that pop up. The DBE application can be found at this website. It's caltrans.dbesystem.com. I also provided a QR code for you. This is what the website looks like. When you scroll down, you'll just click on apply for slash renew certification. Clicking that will take you to this page. If you've never been certified, you just wanna make sure that you create an account and um, you are also able to renew your certification on this site as well. When you're filling out your application, 
We'll start with your tax ID, just to make sure that you don't already have an existing account on our site. And then you'll enter the rest of your business information. The process takes about 90 days from receipt of the complete application and can be extended up to 60 days. And then just a note for um, the DBE bidding, uh, you do have to have an account with BidX and it is a monthly fee and um, a one-time fee. So just be aware of that as well. Well, once you're certified, again, we recommend connecting with your local DSBL. Again, that's District 8, Shanae Farrow. Um, in the meantime, while she is out of office, I'll be your main point of contact. We also have our statewide DSBL contact list. So if you're looking to do business within other is a good resource to have. Uh, we recommend proactively seeking Caltrans projects. So that means checking Cali Procure, checking Contractors Corner regularly just to see if there's any new things coming up. And then last, signing up for our mailing list. So uh, this is the QR code that I mentioned in an earlier slide. Again, you'll get notifications about upcoming procurement, contracting, and outreach opportunities. So I'll give you a moment if you'd like to see you say these characters. So there are a few contracting opportunities that Caltrans offers. We have procurement. So these are for, for Caltrans purchasers purchased directly from suppliers. We have our public works contracts. So these are contracts for construction projects on California right-of-ways or at Caltrans facilities. And then we also have our a &E contracts. So these are for professional, consultant, architectural, and engineering services. Okay, moving on to locating bid opportunities on Cal e Procure. So to locate those opportunities, you'll go back to Cal e Procure's website. On the main page, there is a start search button. So once you click that, it'll take you to the event search page where you'll enter your product or service in singular form. So for example, if you sell pens, just type in pen just so it renders you the most results. And if you're looking for Caltrans specific opportunities, you can type in our department code 2660 in the department box, and this will bring up only Caltrans opportunities. And if you want to search the entire database, you can just leave it blank, or you can select the menu icon and browse the different departments that have opportunities available. So these are all state agencies. Once you're certified, you're eligible to bid on any project in this database that you qualify for. And these are what some of the search results will look like. You're able to click on whichever project interests you. The event ID does start with the district number, so for Caltrans at least. So the very first event starts with 08, meaning that this project is in District 8. Let's go ahead and click on that one. This is an A&E professional services contract. Once clicked, it'll bring you to this page where you will find the event package that will give you more information on the project. You may also find the vendor ads for anyone who's thinking about bidding and would like assistance. You can also place your own ad if you'd like to. Just something to pay attention to on this page is the event end date because that is the deadline for bidding. So clicking the event package will take you to this page that will have everything you need to know to bid on the project. If it is a large project, typically the prime will handle preparing the package and will notify the sub or supplier if there's anything that they need to provide. So for bidding on Contractors Corner, so Contractors Corner is where we list all of our construction contracts. The website is ppmoe.dot.ca.gov. I also have a QR code on this page if you'd like to access it. Um, this site is used for large public work construction projects, and the process is slightly different from bidding on Cal e Procure. So if you are a first-time bidder, you must click on the first-time bidder's click here link that's circled in red because you have to, again, register for a BIDX account, pay a one-time fee, as well as monthly account fees, and then you should be uh, issued a digital ID making you eligible to bid on these projects. 
It can take up to seven days or longer to be issued your ID. So definitely if you're thinking about bidding on a construction project, be sure to do it. Start the process as soon as possible, just so you're ready. Then to locate projects to bid on, you can select the advertisement tab and click on any of the links that interest you. So advertised projects are ones that can be actively bid on. So clicking this week will take you to all of the projects that were advertised this week. Some important links to note on this page are a list of bid items. So this shows you what needs to be bid on. You also have bidders inquiries. So if someone asks a question about the project, everyone has access to see that question and answer. Uh, clicking download files takes you to the project files. And then towards the bottom of the advertisement where it says sub slash suppliers, you will see links to opt in. So if you're interested in bidding on the project, you may opt in and the Prime can contact you directly about bidding with them. Just be sure to include your email address so that they can contact you. And then please pay attention to the bid opens date. So this is the date that um, bidding opens and closes. It's the only day you can bid and it closes at 2 p.m. And if there is a mandatory pre-bidding, or pre-bid meeting, it will be listed on the solicitation page. Again, primes are required to attend the mandatory pre-bids because it allows small businesses to network with them. And while small businesses are not required to attend, we do, again, highly encourage attending. So when it comes to the construction field, it is usually beneficial to know the projects that are coming up before they're advertised. So Caltrans created a space to find those projects in our 24 month look ahead report. You can find this on Contractors Corner um, in the advertisement section as well. So this is what the report looks like. It'll tell you the expected advertisement date, although just keep in mind sometimes these dates can be delayed. Lastly, we have our A&E contracts. So this is the last type of contract we'll be talking about today. Again, these are architectural and engineering contracts that are stored on Cal Eprecure, but you can also find them on Contractors Corner as well. For information on A&E projects, you can head to our website. we have provided a QR code for this site for easy access. On this page, you'll find the advertised A&E projects. If you click on the link, It'll take you directly to the Cal Procure advertising page. You'll find a look ahead report for these projects. And lastly, more information on the contract process. And they do have an upcoming bid meeting for a contract, but I'll be sure to give you more information on that if you sign up for our mailing list. Okay, again, these are the QR codes that we saw throughout the presentation. So if you'd like to bookmark these pages, here's your last chance. All right. Getting into our FAQ. So these are just some of our frequently asked questions. So how long does it take to get paid with Caltrans? Typically, it takes 45 days to get paid with a prompt payment system. If you're a subcontractor or supplier, you'll typically get paid seven days after the prime gets paid. As a supplier, how does the CalCard program work and how can a supplier accept payments through it? So CalCard is the state of California service mark for our visa card. So if you accept visa, then you can accept CalCard. The purchaser will work with you directly to obtain any required forms as necessary. And um, CalCard only works for certain items, so certain items won't be uh, certain items won't be eligible for payment through CalCard. How do I find out about upcoming projects with Caltrans? You can sign up for our mailing list, and you'll receive our monthly newsletters and notifications of our upcoming events. And there's that QR code one last time for you. If you'd like to save it. Okay. You know, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, please stay up there. Oh, okay. Um, 
same as I did with Jane. Jane, she had things she presented, and she, you know, she gave the answers. But I have a little deeper question for it, and more so, I'll prep you. I'm looking for trends. So my question is: Are there many projects found with little or no bids on them? What are those projects? The purpose of that is: What are the trending things that we can look for? And hey, no one's bidding on this. This is something that 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 um. Contracts are per are business businesses are looking to get contracts on, but no one's bidding on these things. No one knows about these things. So, what are those trends? I don't think have exact numbers of what that looks like, but um, typically, at least for construction projects, um, on our mandatory pre bids, usually we don't have as high of an attendance as we would like. So, if there are small businesses that are interested in getting into that line of work, you definitely want to attend those meetings just because you'll be the only ones typically there. Um, and it's, again, a good opportunity to meet and form those connections with the prime. So definitely put your face out there, let them know that you're available and ready to work. So construction projects? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, so that's asked my question, what is their demand for construction projects? Mm -hmm. uh, so my other question is, um, as I'm transitioning, and you and I've met, uh, you spoke a little bit about what I'm looking for. How many, how many transitioning military service members have you met that are um, that are in their planning phases of entrepreneurship? So far, I've only met one, and that's Travelers. So, um, if you're again in that transitioning phase, definitely start meeting people, start networking, talking, getting your face out there, your name, because people will rem remember and if there is a contract or procurement opportunity, we'll keep you in mind and um, ensure that you kind of get to be that first person to bid. Thank you so much, Abigail. First. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again uh, for having skin in the game. I'll, I'll let you all know that um, the ARC will present anyone who is a sponsor, not present, but sponsor anyone who has skin in the game, who's willing to have skin in the game. It's about meeting people, connecting, and providing resources. Um, with uh, Abigail, I asked that question because I I start to realize that no one's prepping before. No one's prepping well enough. I won't say you're not prepping, but a lot of people are not, a lot of the service members are not prepping well enough prior to ending their service. Um they start doing, a lot of us start doing the work afterwards and start networking, start doing the resources and, and connecting afterwards. You can do that years. You know, I'm, I'm retiring after, I've retired after 26 years. I could have been doing this. I just didn't know about it. And I wish that I would have. So I say again, please listen. I want to introduce one last person, Albert Renteria, uh, owner of the ARC. And he helps, he helps put these things on. And I, I, I appreciate it. And thank you for allowing me, giving me the opportunity to do the, um, presentation for this time. So without further ado, Al. Well, <clears throat> thanks, Travis. And as we end the year 2023, I, I want to tell you what kickstarted my effort. I was in Jakuska, Japan in 1999, uh, around October or so, and I was introduced to Public Law 106-50 legislated August 17 of 1999, Veteran Entrepreneurship. <clears throat> it was at that time that I took the steps to retire on April 1st of 2000, April Fool's Day uh, intentionally, because the future is in the hands of every active service member and the 18 million veterans that represents a stronghold on small businesses, but have not really understood how to navigate the landscape. And I asked Travis to ask the question I asked Abigail, and thank you, Abigail, uh, on how many service members she has met uh, since she's been doing this. And how long have you been doing this? Six months. So let's let's make sure that you take the steps Travis has taken uh, and start navigating the landscape now. And we can all point fingers that the transition assistance program uh, is not adequate. But remember, active service members work on an op temple and purse temple model. So the tax dollars pay for operational temple in hopes that our purse temple 
uh, is cared for independently. And that's why technology is, is such what it is, is service members today can log in either through a cell phone or some PC and access all of their data and make sure that that is accurate. But as we end 2023, I want to thank all the presenters. Uh, all these videos are on demand at optorets.tv. So you have not missed anything if you're not seeing this in its entirety. 2024 is going to be much different. Our viewership, because of the economy, has been mostly online. So 2024, we're going to do nothing but webinars. And our strategic partner, the Department of General Services, we're working out the bugs to figure out how we launched January 16, which will be Megan from DGS. So look forward to 2024. It's really about accessing data, but most importantly, what to do with that data. So drill down, drill down. If you're asking the question, more likely it's written down somewhere. Find out where that's at, as Jane said, uh, um, over and over is find the VSO, but if you aren't looking for the data that the VSO is reading, don't contact the VSO until you've read that data. With that said, I'm closing out 2023. Thank you, everybody out there. We're here 24 cents because it's on my cell phone as it is yours. But remember one thing, the future is in your hands and your descendants needs a strong foundation that you're going to about to build so they can leave your legacy from years to come. So thank you, Daniel, at the other end. And thank you, everybody, and have a merry, merry Christmas and a super holiday for those that celebrate other than Christmas. So God bless, and we'll see you in 2024. Out.